but a closer look reveals a series of complex patterns. Though these appear random, a trained observer can spot any abnormalities. One scientist, Dr. Shobe, starts to notice that some areas of the brain appear to be a lighter pink than normal. When Dr. Shobh looked at these tissues, he began to notice that in a specific area of the brain, the neurons, the, the cells that actually transmit the nervous signals, were dying and dead. There were areas of the tissue that were, that were almost ghost-like. We see a pallor or paleness where the tissue has literally dropped out and died. We're also able to go down at a thousand times magnification and see individual neurons that have died. They've become shrunken and shriveled. Shobe and his team begin by observing what appears to be a normal brain with active neurons. Blue in color with a dark nucleus inside. But then they start noticing some that are bright pink with no nucleus. The neurons here have died. It's very obvious under the microscope that those cells are no longer functioning. And when they check the sample, they see it comes from the area of the brain that controls movement and balance. Suddenly, the symptoms make sense. Without those neurons, or with abnormal neurons, you can't transmit the signals that, that give you coordination, that, that allow you to swim appropriately. And these animals were basically, um, they were swimming without steerage. In fact, the brain damage explains all of the symptoms. The disorientation, the loss of balance, the nerve damage, and the drownings. Portions of the alligator's brains are dying while the animals continue to live. This is the real breakthrough the team has been waiting for real concrete evidence at last. But they're still no closer to finding a culprit. Nearly 100 of Lake Griffin's alligators have died. Many more have become zombie-like. Tiny holes in their brains reveal the cause of death but the identity of the attacker remains a mystery. Initially, we were excited to find, hey, there's a problem. We know now that there's a lesion, an area of damage in the brain. And then it was a matter of figuring out what it was. And there's still a variety of things that could cause that. The investigators turned their attention to the quality of the water in the lake. And a lot of people suspected a poisoning, some sort of toxicity. Um, the common ones being pesticides or herbicides, uh, metals like mercury or lead. And so a lot of the investigations were centered around trying to find the source of this poison that was acting probably on the brain. A team from St. John's River Water Management District is asked to test the lake. Supervising the task force is Jeff Elledge. What happened in Lake Griffin is that uh, man's activities caused that lake to deteriorate rather rapidly over the course of two or three decades. Lake Griffin was once a backwater, peaceful and tranquil. A safe haven for a broad array of wildlife. But then, 20th century life intruded. Wildlife was replaced by people, vegetation by housing. With people comes pollution. People often think of wastewater plant, you know, where the sewage goes as the, the pollution source, but it's only one of many possible sources. When a homeowner puts fertilizer on their lawn and irrigate their lawns or when rain hits that lawn, part of that fertilizer is washing off into the lakes. The attraction of living here is to have a property that backs onto the lake. Local residents pamper gardens that stretch right down to the water's edge. 
yet homeowners are not the only possible culprits. Pollution can come from agriculture. They use fertilizer as well. They need that to grow crops. Since the 1940s, canals were dug and huge tracts of marshland around the lake were drained and used intensively for agriculture. They were known locally as muck farms. What a muck farm is, it's a farm that is on very organic soils. And the muck is actually vegetative material that is uh, degrading. It's a very black, kind of oozy material, and it was very productive for agriculture. One huge compost heap, perfect for growing crops. But to ensure its productivity, it's augmented with pesticides and fertilizers. For 50 years, tons of these nutrient pollutants were pumped directly into the lake. In the 1990s, muck farms were phased out. Many of the pesticides they once used were banned by the US government years before but their legacy lives on. The pollutants lie dormant, wrapped up in the soil, slowly seeping back into the lake. They aren't being used anymore, but they last a long time. Some of these may last 50 years or even longer in the environment. Could this concoction of chemicals slowly seeping into the lake have something to do with the alligator deaths? No one was sure what was causing it, but it was an indication there was something wrong in the environment. You know, alligators have been around for millions of years. You know, they're tough. But then all of a sudden, we started to see these big mature alligators die. You know, that's an indication that we're really in some kind of environmental trouble. In an attempt to assess the extent of the damage, water samples